The year is 1400. You and your comrades face a very tough challenge. You have to take down the ultimate fighting machine of the Middle Ages. In a fight like this, an ordinary weapon just won't do. You need something extreme, something truly bizarre. Now this type was known as the um, holy water sprinkler. Combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. It was called a golden tug, bill hook, crow's beak. How to win with weird weapons of the Middle Ages. Say hello to the knight in plate armor. 250 pounds of muscle and precision steel. Skilled with the broadsword, tested in battle, one of the finest fighting men in history. That is the medieval version of the tank. And he's coming towards us. So, how do we defeat him? Any ideas? Shoot an arrow at him. Yeah, well, we could fire an arrow at him if you were an extremely good shot with a very strong bow. At close range, the arrow might just penetrate that armour, but it's likely to bounce off him. How else? Come on, he's coming towards us. How else? Crossbow? Yeah, well, OK, there's a crossbow right there. Start winding it. It takes a minute to wind it up and load it. I don't think you've got time. Any other ideas? Come on, he's getting closer. How about a handgun? Handgun. OK, well, the medieval handgun was incredibly inaccurate. And you just missed him. And he's right here. He's got through. I think you can stop winding now, Finn. So what do we do? We have a knight in plaid armour standing in front of us. We need to know what weird weapons we can use to win against the plate armoured knight. The plate armoured knight was the terror of the Middle Ages. Time and again, armoured knights defeated hordes of unarmoured foot soldiers. They were such an awesome force that a handful of well-equipped men could defend a castle against an entire army. You have a number of choices against plate armour. You can crush it with something heavy, try and crack it open with an axe, or puncture it with a spike. Alternatively, you can try and pierce it with a short, sharp, stiff blade. Or you can go for the gaps. Every armour has them, areas that have to remain flexible and cannot be covered by plate. Unfortunately, there aren't very many of them. But you can try behind the knees, under the armpits, up and under the breastplate, or indeed any joints of the armour, including the visor. Every armour has a weakness. Somewhere. The trick, of course, is finding your opponent's weakness before he finds yours. So there he is. Any suggestions? We could push him over. Yeah, we could. I suppose if we got close enough to him, we might just be able to push him over. So let's try it. Now, he's used to wearing armour. He's worn it all his life. This armour is fitted to him and he's just going to get straight back up. Anything else? Hit him with a really big sword. We could do, yeah. There's a big sword over there. Hand it over. Let's see if that'll work. Now, first of all, if we want to hit him with something really big, we'll have to get close enough to do it, if he allows us to. So let's try it. Here we go. Of course, he's got his own sword, and it's a lot lighter than mine, so that's probably the last stroke that I am ever going to get to make. So, next idea. Would a really sharp sword go straight through the armor? Well, it might. So let's go and find out. All right, guys, this is a sharpened sword of modern steel, probably as good as anything they had. And here is a piece of plate armour, very thin plate armour, but Tim thinks that he can thrust this sword through that, so let's have a go. Put your goggles on. All right, here we go. This is a once only, Tim, get it right, yeah? Ready? Congratulations, Tim! At uh, arm's length, with two hands, with all your strength, you managed to puncture it by about an inch. In the meantime, <laughs> you've been hit three times by the man who's been wearing that plate armour, so I think, on the whole, we need to look for some other ideas, don't you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the evolution of specialised weapons actually began before plate armour was widely used. Until the 13th century, most knights wore a shirt of mail, woven out of interlocking iron rings. Chris, come on up here. Now, your opponent is a male armoured knight. He has a weapon. You have two choices. You either get a longer weapon than he has, in which case you can strike him without him striking you, or alternatively, you have to get inside that guard of his. So, for that, 
you need a shield. If you have a shield in your left hand, you can parry his weapon away and move in. Good, now you're close enough to hit him. So what are you going to hit him with? Well, several choices. Let's try this one. An axe. Now this is double-handed axe. It'll certainly go through that male armor, but there's no way you can use it with a single hand. So with a shield, you have to compromise. You have to use a smaller axe. Now that will go through him. Hit him in the shoulder. But even a small axe could be unwieldy and inaccurate, and it didn't have the versatility of a sword. So the armorers came up with the first weird weapon, the falchion, designed to help you win against male armor. Now the falchion, it's a very interesting weapon, combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. All the weight is behind here, behind the point of percussion. Now this means that it was an extremely effective weapon against male, could cleave right through it. Question is, how good was it against plate armor? Not very. Maybe we should try something else. Another adaption of the sword was this late medieval broadsword. It's much shorter than the old cutting sword, and it tapers to this extremely sharp point. This is a magnificent weapon, but it needs to be made of the highest quality steel, otherwise it will shatter in combat. The most extreme version was this, the estoc. A purely thrusting weapon, designed for thrusting into the gaps of armour. But thrusting swords like the Estoc were only good if you were well trained and highly skilled. In the heat of battle, you might need something a little more basic. One of the most unexpected weapons of the Middle Ages was also one of the simplest, the wooden club. Apply a bit of technology and you get this, the mace usually made of steel, between four and six pounds, with these longitudinal ribs on the end. Now, these would make sure that any blow against an unarmoured man would be deadly. It also increased the effectiveness of any blow against plate. These came in various styles. You could have spherical and oval ones with spikes, and even very fancy ones like this. This was a knight's weapon for use against other knights. <laughs> The mace was an extremely aggressive weapon, but to use it effectively, you had to get in close. You could even deflect the occasional sword stroke. It is usually used with a small shield. Medieval battles often developed into massive crushes as the rear ranks piled in behind. And in these circumstances, the mace was the ideal weapon to have. This man is at my mercy. But wait, now I have to ask myself a question. Not how do I finish him off, but who is he? Why does it matter? You'll find out in a minute. Here's where we left off. This man is at my mercy. But who is he? So why does it matter? Well, if the man on the ground is a knight from a wealthy family, you want to keep him alive. You can get big money if he or his family pay a ransom for his safe return. On the other hand... If this is a man at arms, not a knight, then he's a dangerous beast, and he could recover at any moment. You're in the middle of a battle here, he's surrounded by his colleagues. You could keep bashing him, but he might roll over, even grab your weapon, so you have to act fast. The moment he's down, you've got to be on him. With this. Now this is where it gets really nasty. Every knight carried one of these. A dagger, purely stabbing weapon, called a misericord. It was called the Dagger of Mercy. That's because... When you were about to stab him, he could plead for mercy. Mercy! And if you weren't interested, you could stab him in the face. Or if his visor was down, you could simply stab him straight through the ice slot. Ah! Or you could find a way into the armor, through the plates, under the armpit, and into the oh! eye. Alternatively, find some gap in the breastplate and squeeze it in that way. Ah! There is ah! one more alternative, but that doesn't bear thinking about. The mace was a good weapon, but you might need repeated blows to actually knock down a well-armoured man. So how do you get the same effect with a single strike? The answer is the flail. The flail was an agricultural tool of ancient origin. It was a wooden club hinged by rope or chain to a long staff. Usually it was used for threshing corn. 
but replace the wooden club with an iron one and you could use it for thrashing men. Six feet long with a two-foot swingle, the Great Flail was especially popular in Eastern Europe and Russia. But it really came into its own as a single-handed weapon. The military flail, also known as the ball and chain, came in many varieties. Uh, this one here, here is a double-handed one with a spiked weight on the end. This will uh, increase the impact of the stroke enormously. An alternative is this one. Extremely heavy, very nasty. Two spiked balls here. With these heavy weights on the end, this will be very unmanageable. You need at least two hands to use it. So the usual one is this. Very simple, short haft, some kind of safety chain or rope for your hand because these are very easy weapons to lose in combat. A short haft, a staple attached to a chain, attached to the spiked weight. Now this type is known as the um, holy water sprinkler. Very amusing. Helmet, please. Now, as you will find in practice, this is an extremely dangerous weapon. Not just for your opponent. In fact, you're far more likely to hit yourself with one of these, if you don't know what you're doing, than to hit anyone else. Now, the flail can strike with enormous impact, but it can also strike you, so you have to keep your arm extended. You need at least one swing to get up to power, and once you're up to speed, paradoxically, it's easier to control at high speed than at low. If you ever stop it, you lose control of it. You've got to keep that ball swinging. So, let's have a go. The flail is a terrifying weapon to face. Not only do you have to watch the man, you have to watch that constantly circling ball. Now you can avoid it, or deflect it, or try and get under it. But it's rather like waiting for a bus. Just when you're not expecting it, one comes along. Or two, or three. Oh. Now it's my turn. As good as it is, the flail isn't perfect. It's a lousy defensive weapon, and if you stop swinging it, even for a second, that's all your opponent needs. Oh. 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 What's worse, it's absolutely exhausting. Another alternative weapon is the hammer. The wooden mallet was a tool for the peasant and for the common soldier. It could also be a pretty handy weapon. The knightly version was the war hammer. This was an excellent weapon. You could crack armor with this side. The hammerhead was often serrated so that it would bite into the armor, not glide off it. And on this side, a long narrow spike that could puncture plate. Here's another one, all steel, looking like a can opener. These spikes were known as the bec de corbin, the crow's beak. And they were light enough for the old one, two. One, two. This type was called a plasson, with a single or double curved spike. Looked exactly like an ice pick, and is extremely efficient. Of course, the problem with all armor-piercing weapons is that you only get one chance to get it right, because <laughs> they get completely stuck <laughs> in the armor. That's the problem with alternative weapons. Just when you think you've got a winner, there's a new hitch. But no one said defeating an armoured knight would be easy. In a moment, we go long and lean with a high-tech spear and a lethal tree trimmer. As we've seen, most weird weapons were inspired by existing weapons that couldn't quite do the job. The spear is a good example. Against plate armour, it was ineffective and the wooden shaft made it very vulnerable. What the common foot soldier needed was a weapon that could make him a match for those men-at-arms in their highly expensive armour. Now, the spear was virtually useless for that, but he could try this, the Aalspies, the eel spear. Now, this has an armour-piercing point on the end of a very long, slender steel blade with this rondel here to give you some protection. Now, this was a magnificent weapon. The advantage of the Arlspies was that you could aim for the cracks and the chinks in the plate armour. 
Or you could try and pierce right through it. Now, with the arse piece, you could keep coming back. Because this long steel blade was not easy to break. The disadvantages were that it was an extremely heavy weapon. And all the weight at the business end. You couldn't have a shield with it because you needed both hands. Which meant that you had to absolutely commit yourself to the blow. And if you failed... Ah! The odds seemed stacked against the common foot soldier. What he needed was a weapon that could cut, thrust and chop at the same time. So, he found one. The bill hook was an agricultural tool with a long hooked blade. It is still used today for hedging and lopping branches. As a weapon, it is of great antiquity. It was used by some of Alexander the Great's infantry. This was the medieval version of the bill hook. A long single-edged blade which curved into a hook, a spike at the end, and a fluke on the back ridge of the blade. This was the most popular medieval polearm, relatively easy to make and used throughout Europe. This is the medieval bill hook. Now, we infantry, we're not armed in plate like you guys. We may have leather and cloth and jacks and maybe some mail if we're really pretty well equipped, but nothing like the sort of technology that you've got on your fronts and backs. But at least we've got this weapon. This can be made by a good skilled local blacksmith. The blade itself divided into these three, the spike, the hook, the fluke at the back. Step forward a minute. There's something about armour which you will immediately notice as you're walking, which is that it gets caught in things. There's lots of bits sticking out, lots of cracks that you can hook into yeah, and just catch. So there's the, the elbows there, there's the shoulders here, there's bits of the body itself that you can hook into. And there you've got him like a fish. Now, of course, you have to get close enough to be able to do that, so what you want to do first is hit him hard, either with the spike, it'll go straight through armour if you hit him hard enough, or alternatively, you can use the fluke at the back. At high speed, would go straight through that armour. Or say that you were riding by me on a horse, so I'm down here as an infantryman. Ride by me and I can sweep you straight out of your saddle. Now, you can use the butt against armour like that to push someone back. You can swing it around just to keep them at a distance. So, it's a pretty good all-round weapon. But frankly, against a really good swordsman, you're not going to have much of a chance. Now, I could parry you, cut to my head. I could parry you there, but I'm completely exposed. Do it again. So I need to at least do that and clear it, yeah? Uh, the problem is that you're going to come straight back cutting at me, so let's have a little routine here. We go to the head, I'm going to clear it, straight back in the middle, there. All right, now, I chose to parry because I thought he was going to give me a cut. He wasn't, he was going to give me the thrust, so I'm dead. You can see my problem. I can only make one mistake. Our arsenal of weird weapons is just about complete, so maybe it's time for a short review. First, the falchion, then the mace, followed by the flail, the hammer and the crow's beak, the arlspies, the billhook. They're all good, but are they good enough to help our team win its challenge against the plate-armoured knight? This is one of the weirdest weapons of the Middle Ages, a long club fitted with iron spikes. It was a traditional weapon, roughly made by local blacksmiths. It was called a Godentag, which means good day. The Flemish must have had a sense of humour. As they hit their opponents, they would say, Godentag. It was used for thrusting, Godentag. For striking, Godentag. And for slashing open the flanks of horses, Godentag. <laughs> Very nasty. How nasty? Well, in 1302, at the Battle of Portray, a magnificent French army came face to face with the Flemish Godendag. This absolutely simple, homemade weapon, wielded by untrained peasants and shopkeepers, was up against mailed, mounted knights of the finest army in Europe. So, who would you put your money on? If you bet on the French, you lost. The Flemish peasants carried the day. In the right hands, the Godendag is indeed a fearsome weapon. But there's only one sure way to win against a plate armored knight. 
This is where it all began. Remember? Before we had the arsenal of weird weapons, our team would have had little chance against this armored knight. But now, against three knights, with a little help from the Godentag, the Flail, the Crow's Beak, and a few friends, well, it's hardly a fight at all. Our team have learned how to win against the armored knight. But all the weapons we've seen in action have one thing in common. No matter how weird and wonderful the weapon, what matters is the man behind it. There was a time when the world seemed headed for destruction by hordes of warriors known to history as the Barbarians. It appeared that only the Roman army stood between survival and the end of civilization. But what was the truth? Who were the Barbarians? And how could they defeat the might of Rome? The weapons of the Barbarians, next on Conquest. All right, guys, gather around. You are a bunch of barbarians, and you have a problem. Over many centuries, thousands of you have migrated into Europe. You now live in many tribes on the borders of a vicious, aggressive military dictatorship called the Roman Empire. Now, we are going to teach you to use a whole range of barbarian weapons, and for your final challenge, you will attack and defeat a Roman legion. So who were the barbarians? The word may come from the Sanskrit for stammering. The Romans believed that their enemies were savage and could barely communicate. They were not Roman, therefore not civilized. This was untrue. Many of the barbarian tribes had advanced cultures and a highly developed morality, which they considered superior to the violent and decadent ways of Rome. Barbarians repeatedly defeated Roman armies in battle but always seem to lose the wars. Let's look at a map. Among the first barbarian peoples who made contact with the Romans were the Gauls. And that was the Roman name for the great Celtic civilization. Extremely artistic, very warlike. Mark, you're going to be our Gaul. Now, the Romans were terrified of you with good reason, because in 400 BC, you invaded Italy and sacked Rome. Now, the Gauls were known as swordsmen, using the long sword like this one. Now, you need strength and flexibility to use that weapon, which is why most of them didn't have armour. So you will go into battle wearing exactly what they did, tattoos and otherwise completely naked. <laughs> Are you kidding? Well, all right, sometimes they wore pants and tunics of wool and fur and hide. And like all barbarian peoples, they used spears and shields and short-throwing spears called javelins. After many wars with the Gallic tribes, Julius Caesar conquered Gaul and crushed the final resistance in 52 BC. The Romans at last took revenge for the earlier sack of Rome in 400 BC. They slaughtered the Gallic people and destroyed their civilization. But it had taken them 350 years to do it. Elsewhere, other barbarians were giving them just as hard a time. Now, in 218 BC, the Romans invaded Hispania, Spain, where they fought for 200 years with the Celtiberians. Mario, that's you. Now, your guys were brilliant guerrilla fighters, and they had some remarkable weapons, including this one, the Falcata, which is based on the uh, ancient Greek coppice, probably brought to Spain by Greek merchants. Now, this was made of the finest quality steel, and the design put the weight of the blade down towards the end, increasing what's called the kinetic efficiency of the blow. In other words, get out of the way. Now, the Celtiberians had another sword called the Gladius. You might recognize this. It's a simple, short, stabbing sword. And they had a spear made entirely of iron called a soliferum. Now, these guys were great metal workers. It's possible that they even invented mail. So, Mario, you've got mail. Many Spanish and Celtic weapons were copied by the Romans. The short sword became the basis for the Roman gladius. The soliferum may have been the antecedent of the Roman javelin called the pilum. The Romans knew a good weapon when they saw one, 
and they needed them. In 115 BC, what we think was an early Germanic tribe called the Cimbri invaded Italy. They defeated five Roman armies, one after another. This led the Roman general Marius to completely reorganize the Roman army. The Cimbri were defeated in 102 BC, but the Germanic invasions had only just begun. The Germanic tribes also used the spear and shield, but they had a bunch of their own weapons as well, including this one, the sax, a short chopping and stabbing weapon. Here, shove that in your belt. They also used the axe. This is the largest type, the broad axe. Now, this could really carve into a Roman shield, but you need both hands to use it. The smallest version was this, the Francisca, or the throwing axe. But you just try throwing one of these. So that's what our team is going to do. Toss a variety of axes against these Roman shields. The throwing axe was useless against a shield. But it wasn't used like that. It was thrown high into the air in large numbers. It must have been very discouraging to get hit with one of these. I also want to show you this. It's a falx, a double-handed weapon popular with another group of barbarians called the Dacians. Chris, you're a Dacian? Now, the Dacians lived in an area of Europe that is now Romania. And from 81 AD, the Romans attacked them. You know, these Romans, they are not nice people to be neighbours with. So now we've got four basic types of barbarian. We have the Gaul, the Celt, the German and the Dacian. They're remarkable warriors and all had excellent and different types of weapons. The barbarians came from different regions and brought different weapons into battle. But they shared the same tactics. Or rather, tactic. There was only one. The direct frontal charge. There are the Romans. Get ready for them. After building themselves up into a frenzy, the barbarians would make a mass charge directly at the Roman line. The idea was to run in as fast as possible, so that the Roman javelins would have less effect. Sometimes, on a signal, they would withdraw. And then charge again, repeatedly. They wanted the Romans to use up all their javelins and be forced back, or to get the Romans to break ranks and give chase. Then, they could be cut down individually. These charges must have looked magnificent and terrifying. Unfortunately, they hardly ever worked. Simple. I mean, they would have killed us with javelins before we ever got there. The Romans were professional soldiers. The barbarians just weren't. The charge feels great. But do we stand a chance when we get there? I mean, these were just hay bales. The real Romans, we never would have broke their lines. We would have got chopped to pieces. He's right. The Romans always kept a reserve of fresh soldiers to replace the front line, and plenty of spare javelins. They didn't tire easily, and they were too disciplined to break ranks. These were the finest soldiers the Empire had to offer. The classic Roman legionary from about 100 AD. So what do you notice about him? The absolute basics. He's a foot soldier. He's well protected. He is the best heavy infantryman in the world. But like all heavy infantry, he has two weaknesses. Cavalry and missile weapons. So from the earliest times, the Romans protected this man by raising mercenary cavalry and infantry from you guys, their enemies. They would divide you up, make friends with some of you, attack the others. They used Gallic and German cavalry, archers from Syria, slingers from the Balearic Islands, and infantry with javelins, swords, spears and shields from Germany, Gaul and Dacia. So, we know that this guy has some weaknesses. Now let's work out how to defeat this creep. Our team has met the enemy. Now they must learn how to beat him. Our team has studied early barbarian tactics. Now they need more practice with barbarian weapons before meeting a Roman legion in battle. This is the spear, the absolutely basic weapon of all ancient peoples. It's simply a pole with a pointed blade on the end. Now, the spear could be used by individual warriors or by massed infantry. The infantry spearmen 
would usually carry a shield in the left hand. He would carry his spear either in the high guard or the low guard. Would you uh, line up behind me and beside me? Now, combined with other spearmen, he could either defend himself or advance behind a wall of spears and shields. Spears! Now, this could be very effective, especially against cavalry and infantry. Ready? By the left, advance! But the individual spearmen had very little manoeuvrability, and the whole system requires a great deal of discipline, training and cohesion. Ready? Charge! Even then, the Romans found this to be no difficulty at all. They would just fix the spears with their shields and chop their way through them. So most barbarians fought as individuals. The individual warrior used a fighting spear of about seven to eight feet long. Any longer than that, and it would become unmanageable. Now, to use it effectively, you have to have both hands, so... No shield, which means you have to rely on the spear both for offence and defence. Now, you could use body armour and a helmet, but these are heavy and slow you down, so most barbarians didn't use them. That's better. Now, against other spears, you have to clear your opponent's blade before you can thrust in yourself. And there are lots of fancy parries and avoidances, all of which are completely useless if you can't counter-attack immediately. Right, let's try it against our Roman. Now, the spear is a stabbing weapon. The idea is to keep it moving, keep it thrusting in repeatedly, changing direction with both the blade and the body. This keeps your opponent guessing. He never knows what's going to hit him next. And it also prevents him from having a chance to cut down at your blade. Don't let him do that. Because your spear then becomes a stick and you look very stupid indeed. Now, the one great advantage you have with the Roman is distance. You keep stabbing in, trying to find his weak points. Go high, force him to lift up that heavy shield. Go for the legs and then high. Keep him guessing. Go for the shield side with a feint and then stab into the unprotected body. Feint, stab! Of course, if he's any good, and believe me, he is good, he's not gonna stand there while you do this. He's going to try and get inside and attack, because once he is inside this spear, you're a dead man. The team try out spear techniques against each other, then against sword and shield. The problem with the spear is that in battle, you don't have the space to dodge about. You have warriors beside you and behind you. You may have two stabs with it before a Roman is on top of you. Shorter and lighter spears were less effective in close combat, but could be used as javelins. These were designed to be thrown into the enemy ranks before closing in with sword, axe or club. Our team is soon throwing javelins with some skill. That's good, but look what happens to javelins against this Roman shield and armour. Now that's not so good. Most of our javelins bounced off the shields and they certainly wouldn't penetrate armour. You'd be very lucky to hit an unprotected face or arm. What's more, the Romans advanced with much better spacing than this, so they presented less of a target for the javelins. Let's look at some other weapons. There's a couple of weapons we haven't talked about. One is cavalry and the other is this, the bow. Now, John, you know a little about this. Here are some bows. Show them what to do. The bow and arrow is a relatively lightweight and all-purpose weapon. Many barbarian tribes included bows as part of their arsenal. But in battle, they presented some of the same problems as the throwing axe. Shot straight on, many arrows would either miss their target or bounce away harmlessly. Instead, squads of barbarian archers would aim high in the air creating a deadly rain and, in theory, terrifying the soldiers below. In close combat, barbarians used various types of cutting weapons. This is the Gallic longsword. It's a slashing weapon, very blade-heavy. You can use it either with two hands or with a single hand and a shield. And against a lightly armoured opponent, this would be deadly and it looks terrifying. But it will not penetrate a Roman shield. And if you get this stuck in that shield, even for a second, he'll be stabbing into your guts. 
Now, an alternative is this, the Dacian Falx, with a forward curving blade that went right over the shield into the helmet of the Roman. In fact, later Roman helmets had reinforcing crossbars to prevent this weapon killing the man who's wearing it. But, again, you've got to hit him with your first stroke, because if you don't, he will. Now, the axe. Everyone thinks this is a great weapon until you actually have to use it. It's true, it's very heavy. And if you actually get a good hard hit on the shield or on the armour, you'll cleave right through it. But he's not going to let you do that. The moment you start your swing, he's going to tuck under that shield, push in and stab. Of course, um, you can get a shield yourself. But if you do that, well, you have to have a much lighter axe in the other hand, which has much less penetration. And even then, for every stroke you give him, he can get two stabs in. Now, here is a weapon that really might work. The Falcata. Now, this had a really useful downward stroke and was so heavy and so sharp that it could pierce through shield, armour and helmet. It also had a really useful point on it. And what's more, it was used with a left-hand buckler, a small shield called a chytra. Now, this combination had a lot more power than the gladius and it was much more manoeuvrable than that heavy shield. But I still don't like the odds. To even things up, barbarians relied on a tried and true military tactic. If you can't beat them, join them. Barbarians who fought in the Roman army as auxiliaries learnt about Roman weapons and tactics. One such person was Arminius, who led the Cherusci tribe of northern Germany. He knew he had to force the legion to fight on ground where they could not use their massed formations. And this is the ground he chose. In the year 9 AD, three Roman legions were led deep into the Teutoburger forest. In the thick woods and undergrowth, the Romans could not fight as a unit, and their heavy armour, shields and weapons were of no use to them. The barbarians ambushed them repeatedly, day and night, jumping at them from every direction. Of 15,000 Romans, only 300 escaped. The Romans could be defeated. If barbarians were to have continued success against the Romans, they would need to use every weapon they could get their barbaric hands on. In the last centuries of the Roman Empire, the whole attitude became much more defensive as Rome withdrew behind walls and fortifications. And you can see this attitude in the weapons of the common soldier of the late Roman army. Look at this sword. It's not a gladius, it's a spatha, a long sword. The gladius was sharp, short, aggressive, a get-in-close weapon. The spatha's much longer. It says, get away from me, get back. The gladius is out. You can see it in the spear, too. The old Roman javelin, that's rejected. Now he carries a spear. Purely defensive weapon. You don't want to throw it, you want to protect yourself with it. And look at his shield, much smaller now. The armour is now mail, not plate. The Roman soldier was less fit, less well-trained, less motivated than he was before. Look at this guy. He looks like a barbarian. That's because he is one. By the 3rd and 4th centuries, the vast majority of the army was made up of barbarians called into Roman service. You guys had got inside. The Romans weren't Roman anymore. They'd lost that aggressive spirit that kept them going. Now, at last, the Romans are just another army. Our team of barbarians has a chance. Coming up, watch out, Romans. It's payback time. It's the final showdown for our team of barbarians as they face off against a Roman legion. There is the enemy, the Roman invaders. Your chance for revenge at last. You've made your plan. Take up positions for attack. The first wave is a frontal assault, easily repelled by the Romans. Our team members know that they must change tactics. Now the barbarians attack with spear and shield men in a wedge formation, as learned from the Romans. They don't try to fight with the Roman line, but to pierce it, to split it into two halves. Despite hard fighting from the Romans, their force is split up. Now each half can be attacked in a different way. 
The first half is bunched up by our barbarians, who run into the attack and then immediately withdraw. Ready, draw! Then, archers shoot at the gathered Romans. They are outflanked and shot down one by one, and those who try to break out are cut down. The second group of Romans is driven back into rough, wooded ground. Here the Roman formation breaks up, and their unique weapons are of no advantage. At last, individual barbarians fight individual Romans and beat them. The ferocity of the barbarian warrior is unleashed and legions of Roman soldiers pay the ultimate price. Well done, team. On their side, the barbarians had vast numbers, many different weapons and outstanding courage. But at first, they could not defeat the Roman military machine. It was only when Rome weakened and barbarian tactics improved that decisive victory was achieved. Just like our team, they had to learn how to win with barbarian weapons. Oh, okay, there's a crossbow right there. Start winding it. It takes a minute to wind it up and load it. I don't think you've got time. Any other ideas? Come on. He's getting closer. How about a handgun? Handgun. Okay, well, the medieval handgun was incredibly inaccurate. And you just missed him. And he's right here. He's got through. I think you can stop winding now, Finn. So what do we do? We have a knight in plate armor standing in front of us. We need to know what weird weapons we can use to win against the plate-armored knight. The plate-armored knight was the terror of the Middle Ages. Time and again, armored knights defeated hordes of unarmored foot soldiers. They were such an awesome force that a handful of well-equipped men could defend a castle against an entire army. You have a number of choices against plate armor. You can crush it with something heavy, try and crack it open with an axe, or puncture it with a spike. Alternatively, you can try and pierce it with a short, sharp, stiff blade. Or you can go for the gaps. Every armor has them, areas that have to remain flexible and cannot be covered by plate. Unfortunately, there aren't very many of them. But you can try behind the knees, under the armpits, up. Put your goggles on. All right, here we go. This is a once only, Tim. Get it right, yeah? Ready? Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations, Tim. At uh, arm's length, with two hands, with all your strength, you managed to puncture it by about an inch. In the meantime, <laughs> you've been hit three times by the man who's been wearing that plate armor. So I think, on the whole, we need to look for some other ideas, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the evolution of specialized weapons actually began before plate armor was widely used. Until the 13th century, most knights wore a shirt of mail woven out of interlocking iron rings. Chris, come on up here. Now, your opponent is a mail armored knight. He has a weapon. You have two choices. You either get a longer weapon than he has, in which case you can strike him without him striking you, or alternatively, you have to get inside that guard of his. So, for that, you need a shield. If you have a shield in your left hand, you can parry his weapon away and move in. Good. Now you're close enough to hit him. So what are you going to hit him with? Well, several choices. Let's try this one. An axe. Now this is a double-handed axe. It'll certainly go through that male armor, but there's no way you can use it with a single hand. So, with a shield, you have to compromise. You have to use a smaller axe. Now that will go through him, hit him in the shoulder. 
But even a small axe could be unwieldy and inaccurate, and it didn't have the versatility of a sword. So the armorers came up with the first weird weapon, the falchion, designed to help you win against male armor. Now the falchion is a very interesting weapon. It combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. All the weight is behind here, behind the point of percussion. Now this means that it was an extremely effective weapon against mail, could cleave right through it. Question is, how good was it against plate armor? Not very. Maybe we should try something else. Another adaption of the sword was this late medieval broadsword. It's much shorter than the old cutting sword, and it tapers to this extremely sharp point. This is a magnificent weapon, but it needs to be made of the highest quality steel, otherwise it will shatter in combat. The most extreme version was this, the estoc, a purely thrusting weapon designed for thrusting in and under the breastplate, or indeed any joints of the armor, including the visor. Every armor has a weakness. Somewhere. The trick, of course, is finding your opponent's weakness before he finds yours. So there he is. Any suggestions? We could push him over. <laughs> yeah, we could. I suppose if we got close enough to him, we might just be able to push him over. So let's try it. Now, he's used to wearing armor. He's worn it all his life. This armor is fitted to him, and he's just going to get straight back up. Anything else? Hit him with a really big sword. We could do, yeah. There's a big sword over there. Hand it over. Let's see if that'll work. Now, first of all, if we want to hit him with something really big, we'll have to get close enough to do it, if he allows us to, so let's try it. Here we go. Of course, he's got his own sword, and it's a lot lighter than mine, so that's probably the last stroke that I am ever going to get to make. So, next idea. Would a really sharp sword go straight through the armor? Well, it might. So let's go and find out. All right, guys, this is a sharpened sword of modern steel, probably as good as anything they had. And here is a piece of plate armor, very thin plate armor. But Tim thinks that he can thrust this sword through that. So let's have a go. The year is 1400. You and your comrades face a very tough challenge. You have to take down the ultimate fighting machine of the Middle Ages. In a fight like this, an ordinary weapon just won't do. You need something extreme, something truly bizarre. Now this type was known as the um, holy water sprinkler. It combines the techniques of a sword with the weight of an axe. It was called a golden tug, bill hook, crow's beak. How to win with weird weapons of the Middle Ages. Say hello to the knight in plate armor. 250 pounds of muscle and precision steel. Skilled with the broadsword, tested in battle, one of the finest fighting men in history. That is the medieval version of the tank. And he's coming towards us. So, how do we defeat him? Any ideas? Shoot an arrow at him. Yeah, well, we could fire an arrow at him if you were an extremely good shot with a very strong bow. At close range, the arrow might just penetrate that armor, but it's likely to bounce off him. How else? Come on, he's coming towards us. How else? Crossbow? Yeah, 